And what I had discovered is that for the first 300 years after Jesus Christ, the concept of co-equality between the Father and the Son was non-existent. Okay, this is where the history starts getting wonky. Like I said, I heard a little something later on about Nicaea that's uber wonky. We'll get to that in a second. But this is just simply untrue. And when you start getting into this, it, it just seems to be, I don't know if our Muslim friends just pass around a particularly bad uh, file <laughs> or just what, but this just isn't true. And it's easy to prove this to be untrue. And I didn't bring any of this up, but we could look at a number of early sources. I don't have them in front of me. I'm just going to give them to me off the top of my head. But for example, when Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, was on his way to Rome to be martyred around 107 or 108 AD, so that would be what? Uh, you said 300 years. This is within 20 years of the death of the last apostle, maybe even 10 years of the death of the last apostle, very first years of the second century. He writes letters to various churches and individuals, and in those letters, he identifies Jesus as God at least unambiguously 10 times, maybe 14 times. He speaks at one point in this beautiful passage about God's salvation being accomplished by the Father and the engine. It's literally mechanes in Greek. The engine being the cross and the rope that lifts us up being the Holy Spirit. So he uses Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this type of, uh, of a situation. So this idea that it did not exist is just documentably untrue. And I just wonder, where are you guys getting this stuff? You're not getting it from reading the Apostolic Fathers. You're not reading Clement. You're not reading Ignatius. You're not reading the Didache. You're not reading Justin Martyr, who in the middle of the second century is identifying Jesus as Yahweh. You're not reading the actual sources. You're reading secondary biased sources, maybe watchtowers or something. They've grossly misrepresented this stuff for years and years and years, but they've been refuted in doing so. So just a question for you. Why do I read the earliest histories of Muhammad, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Isham, why do I read those early sources and then Bukhari and Muslim and the others? But you won't read our early sources. Is there a reason for this, is the question. There's not a single church father that says that the father and the son are co-equal with one another. Not true. They're only taken in a dual nature, that you can only get to the father through Jesus Christ by following in his footsteps, as all the other prophets before him were in that... Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, all the other prophets said the same thing? No, they didn't. Jesus' claim to be the unique representative of the Father is absolutely unique. None of the other prophets did anything like that. None of them said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. None of them said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm not sure where this is coming from, but to deny the uniqueness of Jesus' claims just is just not really honest. Now, the concept of the Trinity was only instituted in the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 by a Roman emperor named Constantine. <sighs> Remember, I hope that we've developed a good enough relationship that he wouldn't get upset at this, but there was a young, zealous Muslim apologist back in about 2008, maybe, maybe even earlier than that, when I really first started engaging Islam after my debate with Shabir Ali at Biola in May of 2006. Somewhere in there, there was a young Muslim apologist who wouldn't do this now, but he put up a video. This is YouTube was just starting to really start rolling back then. And you can only do 10 minute videos and stuff like that uh, back then. But put up a video saying, uh, talking about how at the Council of Nicaea, the gospels were chosen by putting all these like 65 gospels in a room overnight. And when they came back in the morning, there are only four Gospels left on the table. All the rest have been knocked down. And that proved that these were supposed to be the four canonical Gospels. And this was a story 
that the earliest example was from like 500 years after Nicaea. I mean, it's just, just mythology. And so I pointed out that the Council of Nicaea had nothing to do with the canon of Scripture and stuff like that. And, but there are few things that are more mythologized than the Council of Nicaea. And here is another mythology. Remember something. Let me try to help my Muslim friends out with a little bit of church history here. The Christian faith had been illegal up until 313, so 12 years earlier. And in fact, the worst period of imperial persecution against Christians was from approximately 250 to 313. So that's six and a half decades or so. Many Christians had lost their lives. And what you need to understand is the Council of Nicaea, many of the bishops were there, bore in their bodies the scars of their beatings that they had endured for following Jesus only a matter of years before that. So you're seriously going to tell me that these people who had lived under Roman persecution only a few years earlier now are so enamored with the emperor of the empire that had been persecuting them that they gave up what they used to believe, because evidently what you're saying is no one believed this until this point in time, and adopted a whole new belief because the emperor said to do so, even though if you read Justin Martyr, you read the people before this, you find repetitive references to the very thing you say they didn't believe, the deity of Jesus, the deity of Christ. It's there from the very start. The most primitive sources, well, it's in the New Testament first and foremost, and then it's in the post-apostolic sources as well, all the way up to the time of the Council of Nicaea. Now, there was a specific question that had arisen in the teachings of Arius, but you would have rejected Arius too. You wouldn't have believed what Arius had to say. Arius said Jesus was the greatest of all of God's creations, not just a mere prophet, and that he had pre-existed. You, you would say Arius was wrong, but the question that they were addressing was Arius's teaching that Jesus was homoousius. Well, he was heterousius, but he sort of danced around the issue because he would, he would refer to Jesus as God. He would use that term, but he's using it in a little different way. And so the issue is that ousius is what makes something what it is. So the Orthodox are saying same ousius. Arius is saying hetero, different. But then there are people in the middle who are going homoi, like. And this was the issue at the Council of Nicaea. What's more, if you know your history, and I don't get the feeling that you do. The Council of Nicaea solved nothing. It solved nothing. The Arians used politics to take over for decades after Nicaea. And in fact, as one writer in the next century had put it, the world awoke and was shocked to find itself Arian. So even though Nicaea had affirmed the status of the sun, there were councils afterwards that denied it and anathematize those people. There's a great defender of the Council of Nicaea, who was not a bishop at the time of the Nicaea, became one very shortly thereafter by the name of Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria. And he was kicked out of his church five times over the next number of decades for refusing to abandon Nicaea. Now, the Arians all ended up turning on each other because they, when you use politics, hey, you guys know this. You Muslims know this. Because I know your history well enough to know how deeply embedded politics has been in it, even in theological development. You know that. You know how many people have ended up getting imprisoned and beaten by the next caliph and, and how that's had impact upon theology. Well, politics generally isn't the best way to promote truth. I think you pro we'd all agree with that, right? And so since the Arians had primarily used politics, eh, their system fell apart. They turned on each other. And the reality is the greatest argumentation, because the New Testament teaches it, had been in defense of the Council of Nicaea. And so 
it is reaffirmed in its uh, formulations at the Council of Constantinople in 381. But there's almost 60 years in there. There's about, there's about a 35 to 40 year period where Arianism reigns supreme. And there are only a few voices, Athanasius being the primary one that stands against that. Even the Bishop of Rome, Liberius, gave in. God's truth isn't determined by votes anyways, so we're good on that. Himself was a Mithrat. Now, I would like to make another video regarding that, but just to give you a little bit of a brief history of Mithraism. Mithraism believed that the sun... Ah, here we go. The, the Mithra myth. This is probably derived from just a lot of bad YouTube videos, I guess, but Mithraism... In all probability, well, first of all, almost all the sources that people use for Mithraism today are much, much later. They're not contemporaneous. If there's any connections to any of these issues, they're probably the followers of this particular Romanish religion borrowing from Christianity, not the other way around. There are references, for example, to the birth of Jesus somewhere between the earliest references are to January 6th, but as early as December 25th, that exist before Mithraism even existed on this planet. So I get the feeling, here's where we're going to get all the alleged parallel stuff that is part of the Zeitgeist movie. It is historically impossible to substantiate. It's really doing history as poorly as you possibly can. And guys, you don't like it when people do that to Muhammad. You don't like it when people mythologize Muhammad. Let's just put it this way. If you utilize the same standards you're using here to try to draw parallels to Mithraism with Muhammad, you would have to reject all of the Hadith as having anything to do with him. You would have to bring in all sorts of external for sources of influence to define his teachings uh, rather than any type of divine revelation. If you were consistent, I've just not found any of you guys who are. I just have yet. Once you start doing this stuff, you're just not being consistent. And I'm, I've got to call you out on it lovingly, respectfully. I got to call you out on it. God would send down his son, Mithras, to die for the people, and they would eat his flesh and drink his blood in order to attain salvation. They would also be baptized. The religious day of worship would be on the Sunday in resemblance to the sun god. And his birthday would also be celebrated in the winter solstice, which... You know, I'm really not sure that being bathed in bull blood is quite the same thing as baptism. <laughs> but again, when you start trying to create parallels without really knowing what the original was, you end up with some really weird stuff is on the 25th of December. So all these similarities is also being found within this concept of Mithraism and Christianity. And the pagans during that time actually wrote out against the Christians and they said that you guys are stealing of our doctrine. And I'd like to see where that is. Could you show us a contemporary document? See, Mithraism arises right as Rome is collapsing and Christianity has already become extremely popular. And... Wouldn't it be much more logical that if you're trying to get something new started, that you'd tap into what has becoming popular in the society? Because uh, again, I can give you earlier than Mithraism, all of this stuff. You can't give me anything earlier than the rise of Mithraism to provide any historical foundation for this. Why were Christians doing these things? Mithraism didn't exist. Then Mithraism comes into existence and all of a sudden Christians are allegedly copying it. What? 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 What are you getting this stuff? Even some of the church fathers, like Tertullian himself, said that Satan preempted this religion in order to overthrow Christianity. So if we look at... Well, what, which religion? Because they're already dealing with Gnosticism at that time. And the Gnostics were a far greater, far, far greater threat to the early church than Mithraism ever was. But which religion? There are no references given here. So you can't check out the original sources. If you're going to make these types of... You know, um, when I said the Quran says X, Y, or Z, I gave you the references. When I said the Hadith says this, I gave you the references. When I said Muslim sources, Ibn Ishaq, whatever, I gave you the references. No references here. You could have put them down the corner or something. I didn't see anything on video on YouTube that said, and, and here's all of our references and stuff like that. Because I'd really love to see them. I'd really love to examine them. We do things like that in this program. By the way, I've been searching for some of the 
phraseology in the Bible quotations? I've yes. been Googling them. Oh, so try to find the trans- I cannot find what translation he's using. I even looked at Islam, Arabic translations into English of the Bible. Hmm. And, and I even I looked at the most liberal ones I could find. I can't yeah, because this it. sounds really... Yeah, it's weird. ...left-winging paraphrase yeah. stuff, so, yeah. Anyway. History itself, there's already all these connections that we can find, but this is not where it stops. In the year 381, at the Council of Constantinople, that was the very first time that the Holy Spirit was added or included into the concept of the Trinity. Except that Ignatius did that in 108, right? Right? If what you're saying is, well, by 381, since the homoousius issue had been settled, now there were two other sets of questions that needed to be formulated in light of that. And that would be the Christological issues, which are going to eventually eventuate in the Council of Chalcedon 451. So, Apollinarianism, Eutychianism, Nestorianism, the relationship of the divine and human in Christ. And then, obviously, the role of the Holy Spirit in his relationship to the Father and the Son. So, if you're saying, well, then they turn to this particular set of questions and address these issues, okay, fine. But that's not what you said. The first time that he's articulate. No, was from the beginning. In New Testament, and then the earliest writings outside the New Testament. Already there. The issue was dealing with controversies as to what certain terms meant, issues along those lines. So, Only once this had occurred was the Trinity fully fleshed, as we understand it, and it is, as it is implemented within the Church today. Except the definition you have isn't really an accurate one, even with what's on the screen. It was the first time that the word Trinity itself meant what it means today, that the Holy Spirit was also added in the seclusion of co-equality.